They've been raptured. Well, wait a minute. They've been raptured. There's something wrong with that. <laughs> <There. coughs> Ooh, I smell onions. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning, Dina. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Good morning, Diana. <clears throat> if you're in the neighborhood, like to join us all here. We're at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And today we are in the book of 1 Thessalonians and one of my favorite chapters, talking about the rapture, being caught up in the air. So I hope that you'll join us by opening up your Bible, get your cup of coffee, highlighter, and a, a pen to, to write some notes down. Hopefully I have some interesting things to say, and I've got a little uh, poem here to read that's kind of special uh, to me that I'll, I'll share with you. So grab your Bibles. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this Friday morning, Lord, just to end this week, Lord. We pray you give us strength throughout this day. It always seems like the finish line is always the hardest part of the week, Lord, but we're here, Lord, and Saturday's coming. Uh, Lord, Sunday's coming where we can just come together, sit at your feet, and just worship on the Sabbath day as we were, we were created to, Lord. And so, Lord, bless us today. Lead us and guide us. And let us start, Lord, with your presence and with your precious word, Lord. And that you would encourage us, Lord God, that you're coming for us soon, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning again. So we're in the book of Thessalonians. That is 1 Thessalonians, and we are in chapter 4, uh, my, one of my favorite chapters. And so I'm going to share with you concerning the rapture. Now, I mentioned this on Wednesday that some people don't believe in the rapture. Uh, they suggest that as they've done their studies. Now, now here's this is my personal view, so just take it with a grain of salt. Uh, as I share this with you, but I believe the word of God is true 110%. Amen. Amen. I think, I believe there's no errors in it at all. I believe you can trust it, believe in it, and bank your life on it. I really do. I believe that it's the most important document in all of the documents in the world, all of the historical books, all that has ever been written. This book has been written by God as he has inspired men to put them down. Now, why do I say that? Because I believe, and this is my opinion, now I get it, we have to look at history, and there are things in history that we can look at and learn from, but history can be rewritten. History is always from the perspective of an individual who's writing that history. If you're a, and I'm just using this because it just came out the top of my head, nothing against anyone, but if you're a Democrat, you're gonna write from that perspective. If you're a Republican, you're gonna write from that perspective. If you go to Germany, there's some history books there that leave out uh, the whole uh, annihilation of the Jews. You won't read about it at all because they don't want it in there. So they have not written that history in, in their uh, books at all. And yet we see the history of it all in, in history in other nations who have fought against uh, Germany at the time. Uh, yet you speak to some Germans and, and you tell them, what about the Holocaust? And they'll go, what Holocaust? What are you talking about? All the millions of Jews that the Germans killed. What? I've never heard of that before. Because they, they, they believe in the history books uh, more than you know, the majority of people that have written about it and the evidence that's there, you know, the pictures and, and all of that. And they discard that. So I am one. I, I love history. I love to read other books. I love to read commentaries by men. But ultimately, guys, uh, the one word that is above all is the word of God, Amen. straight and clear. And there are those that they will say to you, as I have studied history and the teachings of our fathers, that is the Christian faith, uh, we can find all the way up until about 100 years ago, no one ever taught about the rapture. And all of a sudden, these men began to come up with the idea of the rapture. So it was introduced into the church, and it's not a doctrine of the early founding fathers. Now, I have to beg to differ with you. Why? Because Paul's talking about it right here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Very clear. He is the founding father of the faith, Amen. who literally written down concerning the rapture. Now, maybe man didn't 
understand it at the time, couldn't comprehend it. Maybe they were thinking of it as the second coming, which can happen. Uh, I had a guy here that was an assistant, and I remember um, I gave him the assignment to teach on uh, the second coming of Christ. And um, he had gone to Bible college um, and apparently missed that, missed that class, I guess. But he, didn't, he could not uh, determine which was the second coming of Christ. Was it the rapture or was it the second coming? So he couldn't figure that out. And so he had, had some major issues there in his theology. Uh, so that happens with people if they don't understand the scriptures. And that's why it's important that we get into the scriptures to understand. So I would probably tell someone that says, well, the rapture wasn't written until just 100 years ago, so it can't be true. No, the Apostle Paul was the original writer of the rapture. And so we'll see that here in the Word of God. And by the way, let me just say this very clearly. Our morality, what we believe to be righteous and right and law, comes from the Word of God. Now, there are some of you that don't believe this. You don't believe this. Oh, no, I believe that, that God has written everything down in the Bible, and I should follow everything that's there. He's given us all truth. If you really believe that, if you truly believe that, then when you're confronted with the issues of today, like abortion then you would say it's against God's word. So I do not agree on abortion. If you're confronted with the issue of homosexuality, gay and lesbian, transsexual, bisexual, and pedophiles, if you're encountering those situations, you will say, according to the word of God, that is sin and I will not participate in that. But you find Christians having sympathy and compassion towards that doctrine. Now, having sympathy and compassion towards a person, yes, and hopefully God will pull them out. But that is a false teaching, and that's a lie from the pit of hell, uh, no matter what uh, the world will tell you. So we have to believe the Word of God. Every bit of the Word is so important. And that's why I love teaching the Bible and going through the Bible and looking at each, each you know, statement in the Bible has a meaning there for us. So let's get into it, and we will see what the Apostle Paul has to say about the rapture. Finally, brethren, now he's like, I'm getting to my point. You know, you have been concerned about the coming of Christ, that maybe it's not true. Maybe Christ didn't resurrect. Maybe we have the wrong faith. Well, finally, brethren, we urge you and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so encouraging them. Finally, I'm getting to the point, but you need to continue to walk in the Lord. In other words, they were straying. They were walking away in some instances because they felt that Christ didn't come back and they must have missed it or it's not true. And so Paul's encouraging them, no, hang on for your dear life. Continue to be faithful to God. Walk in his ways. Walk in his laws. A very clear commandment there. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Isn't that interesting? Even the Thessalonians were dealing with sexual immorality. That seems to be a thread. If you go all the way to Genesis and to Revelation, sexual immorality is always a thread of sin that people deal with every day. We deal with it more and more today than ever before. If you ever... If you watch television, I don't watch a whole lot of it, but I'm noticing if I ever come across a, a show, I oftentimes just stop to see. But almost every sitcom, every movie now will have a person that's uh, dealing with some sexual sin. And it's accepted. And, and, and that's the whole purpose of putting it in the movie, the show, and so forth, is so that everyone realizes it's okay to be like that. You know, according to the culture. And according to the culture, it used to be wrong to be like that. Do you know that there's medical books back in the early 1900s that said homosexuality was, was a medical condition? They didn't believe that it was a, um, a way of life or that it was instilled in their birth. They believed it was a medical condition, just like alcoholism and, and other things. In other words, it was sin. And now they're removing that from the books because the culture now is trying to say, let's accept it. Wow. Uh, now, why, why would they want to accept it? Because they want to enjoy it. I really believe that. That was the sin of the world back in Noah's days when they did everything that was unimaginable in their minds, right? We saw that in Sodom and Gomorrah, very clear. 
Uh, we see it in Romans chapter 1. We saw in the Roman Empire where one of the emperors was homosexual, even played the role of a husband and wedded a, a man for his wife, and then played the other role where he felt that he was the wife and he would be married uh, to a husband, you know? So again, their identity was so confused even then. Same, it, it's the same stuff the enemy uses to, to distract people. So Paul is here, is here saying very clearly, look, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That's something that you should do, by the way. Uh, God can help you and through his power, but you have to take the steps uh, to stop uh, performing or being involved in sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel, that is his body, in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. Ooh, that's big, isn't it? Mm. Look, if the Gentiles who don't know God, who have no relationship with God, no concept of who God is, nor do they love him, if they participate in these things and you're participating in these things, what are you saying? You're saying you also don't really know God. And isn't that what First John says, right? Mm -hmm. If you love me, you keep my commandments. Well, then if we don't keep your commandments, what's the implication? You don't love me as much as you say you do. We need to understand that. And so he's saying here, like the Gentiles who have no God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brethren in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanliness, but to holiness or in holiness. So what is Paul doing here? He's encouraging them to continue to walk with the Lord. Don't lose heart. Galatians says, you know, don't go grow weary of doing good. You know, as you see the day approaching, continue to have fellowship one with another. And so these are important things that we need to do. Don't backslide. There are a lot of Christians that are backslidden. You know, we don't know if they're, they're Christians or not. That's up to God. They're, they're living a life like the prodigal son. They're in the world. They're enjoying the things of the world. They're mingling with the world. They're in the miry pit with the world, you know, and they think they're okay. But the Lord will draw them out if they're truly His. So we need to be very careful that we don't backslide. You can't go forward, as Chuck would always say, if you're walking backwards, right? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. No, God has called us into holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God. Oh, that's another big mm. one, right? If you are doing these things, you're not rejecting man. You're rejecting God. Now, let, let's, let's look at that just for a second here and just... If your brother comes to you and says to you, brother, I love you, but you're li living in sin, or sister, you're living in sin, and it's wrong, and God's going to rebuke you. Now, their response is usually one way. You can't judge me. Who do you think you are to judge me? Now, is it you that's judging them, or is it God that's judging them? It's God. It's God. They'll say it's you, but Paul is being very clear. It's not man that they're sinning against. It's God that they're sinning against. And so just because a man is telling you and correcting you and encouraging you to do the right thing, and then you get upset at it, I mean, you might not like it, and you might not like him because he's the one telling you, but you're not rejecting him. You're rejecting God. Now, if you're on that end where you're the one correcting and trying to get people to do the right thing, and they're saying, oh, you're so judgmental, you're so holy, you're so right, you know, all those words that they use, then realize, no, that's not true. I am trying to be faithful to God. I love you enough to tell you, you know, and to correct you. Now, it will be on you because what they're trying to do is trying to weaken you. They're trying to weaken you so that you don't do that. You might hurt some other, someone else. There was someone here years ago that... Um, there were some situations that were happening at the time. So it was very, um, what's the word? It was very sensitive in the church. So every time I taught, it's like I had to watch every word I said, it seemed like. And there was one day when I taught, uh, and very clearly I wasn't thinking about anything. I just taught what the word said. And as I went out to church, someone came up to me and says, do you know that you offended that family? And I'm like, what do you mean? What you said up there was very offensive to that family. And so now I'm questioning myself, what did I say? Oh my God, so I'm thinking about this, I'm praying about this, so 
I ended up going to the family and I said, hey, I, I wanted to apologize to you if I offended you from the message. And they're like, no, you didn't offend us from the message. What do you, we don't know what you're talking about. So it was somebody else projecting what I said onto something else because they felt that I offended. So they were looking at me. That's what they were doing. They were watching me. They were nitpicking me, everything that I said, and to see if it was offensive to anybody or anybody else. That's not the way we approach the Word of God. When we sit in the, in the chair, just like I sit in conferences, when me and Randy go to conferences, Manny went with us to the last one, we sit there to receive, not to you know, nitpick the message. Oh, he said that scripture, it was wrong. It's not that scripture, it's this scripture. And we forget the whole message and what God is saying to us at that moment. We need to receive the word. If there's something that's said that's wrong, you just throw that to the side. You receive what God is saying. God will work that out, right? His word will not, what, return void. Yeah. It's his word, not the pastor's word. It's his word. What I say from this mouth that goes out, you know, and, I, and that's my prayer. Lord, let that fall on the ground. But what you're saying, that it hit the hearts. And that's, that's my heart, is that the word would hit the hearts. And anything that I say from my flesh would just hit the ground. And that people would have grace enough to see that and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? And he speaks to us all differently, doesn't he? Yeah. All differently. So they'll try to tell you you're judgmental, but no. They're rejecting who? God. They're rejecting God. Very clearly he says here that they uh, reject God. God, who has also given us the Holy Spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do, not, you do so towards all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Now, this is the second time he said that. Verse 1, abound more and more. So it sounds like through the Holy Spirit, God says you should always be growing. You should always be uh, maturing. You should always be learning. I'm still learning. Every time I have to confront someone, I'm learning. Every time I have to do something, I'm learning. Uh, we should always be doing more and more and looking to serve the Lord even more and more. Now that's challenging because some of us might think, I'm doing so much already, you know, and it's a lot. Believe me, I know how you feel. <laughs> I'm like, Psh, my head this in the mornings are just like Psh, so much going on. I'm a multitasker, task, tasker, task, tasker. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. For some reason, it sounds funny. Uh, and so I'm able to like do the administration work and then I go over and, and do a little bit of my study and then I go over and, and do some painting. Like, and, and I like that because it, it makes things uh, non-mundane to me where I'm just constantly administering for hours and hours and hours and I'm like, <gasps> you know, <clears throat> where I can say, okay, I can stop right here and I'll just go over there and paint a little bit. And I paint a little bit and I, Oh, okay, let me go over there and lay down and, and just study a couple of verses here. You know, and I do that. But at the same time, you're like, ah, oh, there's so much to do. You know, and it's just, uh, it's too much. I learned something from a businessman that I heard on, I think it might have been Facebook ad or something like that. And they were interviewing businessmen and what makes them successful. And this one young man said, uh, what I do so that I don't stress out and I don't do too much is I try to get three things done a day. Just three things. And if I can get three things done every day, it's interesting how everything will get done. But if you're trying to do everything all in one day because you miss out other days, he goes, this becomes very stressful. So just try to do three things a day. So that's been part of my goal lately is just do three things. And when you do three things, you're good. Put it all away. And now you can kind of focus on what you need to focus on, what you need to do. And that's usually studying for, for me. So I try to get three things done a day. It doesn't matter what those things are, but I need to get them done. Like I have a list that I make, and I look at the list, and I, go, I can get that, I can get that, I can get that done today, and then I'll be done today. And that list was like this, and now it's like this, you know? And it will continue to fluctuate, and as I continue to do three a day, eventually it, there's nothing there. You know, what's mostly on the list is what we're doing here in the church. But um, we should be doing more and more and more. Now, that's what's the opposite of that? Doing less and less and less. <laughs> and there are people that are like that. I don't want to do that today. You know? Well, make sure you get your three things done and then don't do it. At least you got your three things done and it will get done. But we should be increasing more and more. Just right there in verse one, very clear uh, that he says that there. And also in verse 10, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, to work with your own hands, as we commanded you. Let me read that again. 
that you should aspire to lead a quiet life. What does that mean? Don't say anything? No. It means stay out of people's business. To mind your own business. I'm convicted right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you start thinking of people and you're like, oh. And you start getting in their business. Instead of just saying, God, you can take care of their business. He's big enough to take care of their business. And to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Uh, the Bible also says if you want to eat, then go to work. You shouldn't be, um, you shouldn't continually, and I have to look at that in the Greek, but continually be uh, taking from others. You should be able to give more than you take. And this is a command, he says here, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may, may, that you may lack nothing. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brother. Now he's going to get to the point. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So apparently there are those that were leaving the church. They didn't have any hope. And Paul says, this is my main writing right here. This is my whole purpose. Now I've encouraged you to continue on, to walk righteously before God. Uh, and I want you not to be ignorant about the things of the future. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, or in other words, who are dead in Jesus. Their bodies are dead, but their souls are in heaven. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, and he's making clear, this is what God has said. Again, those people that say, well, but God never said these things, the rapture, listen to what he's saying here, the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Now the word coming of the Lord is where we get the word caught up or rapture. He goes on and says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, is he talking about the second coming or is he talking about the rapture? The coming of the Lord in verse 15, uh, the shout will happen, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, so that means the church who's alive on the earth, remain, shall be caught up, again, caught up, raptured, together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with God the Lord. So we are here on the earth. We've remained. God will come. The shout of an angel, the sound of a trumpet, and we will be caught up, he says, right? Caught up with the Lord. So it sounds like we're being taken out of the earth, like we're being raptured. Yes, the Bible doesn't use the word rapture at all. The word caught up here in verse 17 is harpazo. That's the Greek word, harpazo. Harpazo means to be snatched away violently. That's what harpazo means. The Latin equivalent to that is rapto. Rapto, to take away by force. Same meaning, same definition. The Latin Vulgate, which is the old Bible in existence, uses the word rapture uh, in the past uh, participle of raptor. Uh, and so, in other words, uh, the English word rapt or rapture is used. So it is a, 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 a true word, and it can be used in that place. We could say raptured, we can say caught up, snatched away. They all mean the same thing. We don't have to use the word rapture. Just because we use the word rapture doesn't mean that that's the word we have to use. You can use any of those words. Okay, you don't like rapture word? How about caught up? Does that sound like it's in the Bible? Because it says right there in verse 17, caught up together with them. <clears throat> now, I always like to give this analogy because it just makes <clears throat> so much sense and it's just so clear the picture. If you were to take a, a bucket and just throw everything into it, junk and all of that stuff, and you were to take one of the, you ever see these big magnets that they use at, uh, at uh, you know, what do they call those trash cars and drunk junkyards with cars and metals and they, they they can turn it on and off right they turn it on also boom just picks it right up and move it over and let it go and, psh, 
So I always like to <clears throat> use that as a picture, go, you know, putting that over a bucket and you just turn it on and everything will just be caught up that is what? Metal. That is metal. Anything that's not metal, it stays there. Anything that is not that type of matter, does not that have that relationship to metal, will stay there. And the same is true of the rapture. That everything that belongs to God will be caught up. Everyone whose minds are on the heavenly things will be caught up. Everyone who is born again will be caught up. Everyone who is not will stay behind. They'll stay behind. And this is why Paul is writing them to encourage them that the rapture is coming. Uh, coming. And so verse 18 says, therefore comfort one another with these words. Right? Comfort one another's words. These are comforting words. And you get, you get people that say, no, the word rapture is not in the Bible. That's not very comforting. And they're not very, being very biblical. <clears throat> That's the problem, guys, of people reading other people's work. That's the problem with reading a commentary. You're going to get what he thinks. And so you have to always measure what everyone is saying by the word of God. That's why I like giving the Greek so that we get the idea of what the word is saying and then going to a commentary comment and so forth because it's aligned with the word of God. And I have found that since I've been doing this and going back over my old notes and stuff and books that I've studied before, I have found commentary comments that are incorrect. And I like delete, <laughs> delete, you know, uh, because now it makes more clear sense, especially in the tenses. So, so it's important that we read the Bible above anything and don't believe man. Yeah. You know, don't believe man. You get these people that will tell you, well, the Bible has errors. And I always like to ask them, can you show me? Uh, no. Why not? Well, because someone told me it had errors. Oh, so someone told you it had errors. So you haven't read it yourself. No, no, no. So you're going to believe someone. You're, you're actually you know, putting your whole salvation, your whole life, eternal security in someone's hands. <laughs> well, not just him, someone else too. Well, the two guys, you need to go straight to the source and read the Bible and see what it has to say. Let me read this uh, to you. This is precious to me. Um, Patty probably may remember this. Uh, I used to teach at Calvary Chapel, Mariloma, when it was around. I would teach uh, Sunday nights. We were in the Old Testament. <clears throat> For some reason, I also did the, uh, the mornings because our pastor had gotten sick. And so I, was take, I took over uh, the ministry for about eight months. And so I must have been in Thessalonians. And she had come in, this lady uh, named Naomi uh, Hema. He Hema, do you know her? You knew her? So she, I'm sure she's passed away by now. Yeah, it's, it was a long time ago. I mean, you're talking over 25 years ago. And she lived here in, off of Etiwanda. And she would come on Sunday nights, I believe it was, because the other churches didn't have a Sunday night service. And she'd come and she'd sit in, she'd pull out her Bible, she'd pull out a, a notepad and her pen, and she'd always write. And she'd always write these great poems. And so I happened to be teaching out of this chapter, and this is what she wrote. And it's called God's Air Lift. Many will be heartbroken or brokenhearted, when God's airlift they have missed. Christ is coming back to claim us sooner than some folks have guessed. I will happen, or it will happen in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, will be changed to be like Jesus and will meet him in the sky. Now's the time for getting ready. The accepted times today. Don't be too late for departure. Seek the Lord, repent and pray. He is coming for the ready. Those who labor, watch and wait. Don't wait till the trumpet's sounding, then forever be too late. Those who will obey the Bible, listen for the master's voice. We will be caught up soon to meet him and forever will rejoice. Isn't that cool? So I've had this for 25 years in my Bible. That's how long I've had my Bible. <laughs> I didn't realize that till now. Praise God. Um, what a hope we have, right? Amen. <clears throat> when the big earthquake comes and they're projecting that the earthquake is going to come and uh, affect California. There's a volcano in, in the United States right now that is so big it will rattle the whole United States. And it's active. And some are saying that it may explode soon. It's that close. We're still waiting for the flood. Some have suggested that that's probably why the United States is not in Bible prophecy 
is that maybe these catastrophes have um, uh, limited the United States' activity in these foreign affairs. And if that's the case, then um, we're out of the picture. We're going to miss all that. That's the hope that we have in Jesus. Those that are truly His. Amen. Those that really want to serve Him and that are thinking about uh, the things in the heavenlies and not necessarily on this earth that God promised us that we'll be caught up and out to be with Him. John chapter 14 very clear says it in verses 1 through 6. Very clear talks about the rapture and He's going to prepare a place and He's going to come back for you. It's a beautiful picture there. Even Jesus talked about the rapture, by the way. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Father, for a beautiful word, for encouraging us, Lord, and challenging us too, Lord. Father, let us live a quiet life, not be in people's business, Lord, but be like Jesus, helping and serving and being ready, Lord, and available for those that need our services, Lord. And Lord, let you take care of the rest, Father. Lord, bless us today. Number our steps as we follow you. Give us more of Jesus today, Lord we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. If you have any prayer requests, uh, please post them or private message me and we will, we will pray for you today. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.